Hi, and welcome to the show where we share the stories of the many who intersect with our healthcare system but are rarely heard from. My name is Kevin Poe, founder and editor of Kevin MD. Today in the show, we have Susan May. She's the author of the book, Nick's New Heart, 30 Years and Counting. And there's an excerpt from that book on Kevin MD titled, The Story of a Heart Transplant in a One Year Old as Told by His Mother. Susan, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. We'll get into your book and excerpt in a little bit. But first off, can you share your story and journey to where you are today? I'm a mother of four, and uh, my youngest one had a heart transplant. I live just north of Atlanta, and I'm also a prolific writer. I write um, nonfiction as well as uh, romantic fiction. I uh, work full-time as a a romance novelist for Harlequin. All right, so let's jump into the book that you posted that excerpt from on Kevin MD. It's titled Nick's New Heart, 30 Years and Counting. So, Susan, tell me that story that you depict in the book. Um, well, I talk about my young, my youngest son. Like I said, he's actually 32 years old now, and he um, was born with a horrible bad heart. He had a uh, hypoplastic uh, left heart syndrome, which is a fancy name for just being born missing a uh, one of the uh, chambers to his heart and um, had his first surgery when he was five days old. Then when he was three and a half months old, spent uh, seven weeks on a respirator and then had another heart surgery when he was a year old. And then just before he turned two, he received his heart transplant and uh, did exceptionally well for many, many, many years and uh, uh, contracted endocarditis Uh, which is an infection around the heart and um, had to have have an aorta replacement. And, uh, and that was 12 years ago. And I had written uh, Nick's new heart uh, when he was graduating from high school and just, it was very much about our family and his younger life. So he became an adult and he's married and ha- uh, has a child and is gainfully employed. And I guess best of all, he doesn't live at my house. So he's grown up to be a functioning adult, which is what his daddy and I wanted him to, to become. So, and um, I'm real proud of him, but I try really hard not for him to know how much. <laughs> that transplant happened about 30 years ago and he had some, certainly some time to reflect on that. So take us into those early years and, paint a picture of some of the challenges you and your family faced during those initial years. One of the first ones that comes to mind is, is Nick is the youngest of four. If I had have had him three weeks earlier, I would have had four children under the age of four. So we were already a very busy, busy house um, when he he came along. And um, any chronically ill child uh, consumes consumes the family. And there's a 60% divorce rate for families that have chronically ill children. So uh, that was, uh, you know, that was a concern. Finances was a large concern. And, but, you know, that is all under the umbrella of you want your child to live. And we wanted Nick to grow up and be a part of the, you know, a part of our family, which he, he has achieved, but uh, I'm pretty sure I'm about the only one that thought he would ever live 30 years with the same heart. So um, he's been in really exceptional, but there were super duper challenging times and emotions ran high um, um, more than once. What was your interactions with the medical team like during that time? I I still love my medical team from that time. And I say that because I still see them regularly and I stay in contact with them. And that goes from the the heart surgeon, who was Dr. Kurt Cantor, to Nick's um, anesthesiologist, Dr. Bruce Miller, um, and transplant coordinator. And ironically, Nick's transplant coordinator, who sat with us the night of Nick's heart transplant, is his adult transplant coordinator mm-hmm. now at um, at Emory in Atlanta. So, um, and a lot of his ICU nurses, we I'm still is in contact with, and um, 
they were our support group. I, there's not a doubt, uh, you know, in my mind about it. And it was real important for my security, not so much Nick's because he was just a baby and didn't know, but to have the same people in our ball game. I liked seeing the same nurses every time Nick had to go to ICU. I liked seeing the same nurses when we were on the floor because I knew um, they were, they had gone from being just nurses and doctors to friends. So sometimes when, from the clinician perspective, we always hear about what we did wrong, but it sounds like in this case, your medical team did a lot of things right. So from the perspective of you and your family, what are some specific things that the medical team did right? Because sometimes we need to hear what we're doing well, so we could continue doing that. They listened. I, they trusted mama's gut about when I, I would come in and say something's wrong, this is not right. I wasn't beyond asking to have a certain test run or um, asking questions. Now, that was a very much a two-way street because I did what they told me to do to take care of Nick and probably to almost too rigid about it. But if they said, you know, give him this medicine, do this, show up for this test. I did what they did, told me to do on that, on that day. And so when I ever, I had a problem, they trusted, I knew what I was talking about. They listened and um, you could tell the look on their faces that they loved Nick. They loved what they were doing. They were eager um, to have uh, Nick get better. And, and live and, and survive. And they feel uh, they're a text away still today, um, even though uh, the doctors and nurses are in the pediatric area or a lot of them. Um, if Nick gets in trouble today, I text them and say, you know, is there anything else you would do in this situation? Uh, because they're still as concerned about him now as they were then. I, one of the things was this, uh, Dr. Canner called after Nick had had a long stay. He called and asked, how is Nick doing? It, it, so we weren't forgotten just because we weren't in the hospital. And Dr. Miller, his anesthesiologist, Nick was put to sleep. Oh, I couldn't even count the number of times. And even this past week when Nick had to uh, go in for a test, he says, you know, what I thought about was Dr. Miller telling me to count backwards, uh, you know, from a hundred and him talking about you in my ear. Those things matter that they really do. And one other instance, Dr. Miller, when Nick had to have an aorta replacement, I wanted him there to put Nick to sleep and his daughter was getting married. And um, he said, I can't be, I can't be there. And guess who showed up? for uh, Nick's uh, surgery, there was Dr. Miller, you know, and he said, you know, I don't really matter in the picture. And I said, yeah, you do. If somebody thinks they're going to die, they want a friend to be the last person there speaking to them. Nick came through it, but it was tough. But yeah, y'all do a lot of things, right? <laughs> Well, you've had a few decades, certainly, to reflect on the initial transplant. Now, knowing what you know now, is there anything that you would have done differently if you had to do this all over again? I don't think we really had a choice in that. Okay. So I'd have to say probably no, because at the time, it nicks the first surgery. Is that there was he either had the surgery he was going to die. There wasn't a question about that. And by the time the uh, transplant came around, there was a debate about that. And we followed Dr. Canner's lead and the fact that Nick had no antibodies that to, to make that decision. And when it was all said and done, I, we went to pathology to look at his heart, his old heart. And the pathologist says there's no way he would have survived another surgery. Mm -hmm. So we felt very confident about the decision we had made about that. And Nick wouldn't, Nick's over six feet tall now. He would have never have grown that tall or been able to play tennis or water ski or snow ski. 
I don't think he would have ever of physically been able to do those things if it hadn't been for a heart transplant. So, um, yeah, I'm comfortable with our, I'm comfortable with our decision. We're talking to Susan May. She's the author of the book, Nick's New Heart, 30 Years and Counting. And there's an excerpt on Kevin MD titled The Story of a Heart Transplant in a One-Year-Old as Told by His Mother. Susan, a lot of families, unfortunately, have to go through chronically ill children and the whole procedure that accompanies that. Now, after reflecting on your experience, do you have any advice to these families who may be now going through similar experiences? My advice is, is, is trust your medical team. And if you are not completely comfortable with your medical team, ask for a second opinion. There's nothing shameful about that. Because if you don't trust your medical team, you're always going to be fighting that, that particular battle. Write your questions for your doctor down so that you can honor their time and yours as well, so that you know you have all your questions answered. Don't demand of your doctor. I, I My trust was is if I called, they knew something was really, really wrong. I didn't abuse that. Um, I I even was given, you know, personal phone numbers, and I, I made sure that it had to be something that was seriously wrong in order for me to use that number. I honored them and they they honored us. And the biggest one is, is live your life and appreciate what you have now and take advantage of what you have now and not worry about the future. Uh, It'll come soon enough. Are there any other messages from the book that you want to share with my clinician audience? I I want to remind you that the, the book is not just facts and figures and stuff about transplants. It's about how a family feels and reacts and uh, deals with a chronically ill child. And I think anyone um, would get uh, something from the book about working with a family and, and how a family perceives what's going on when their child is chronically ill. So tell me a story um, from the book that's particularly poignant about how your family persevered through this challenge. I prayed that that Nick would live and survive. And the first day of school, he, uh, which is very traumatic for most mothers, which I guess in some ways it was traumatic for me too, but for him to be, you know, live to be old enough to go to school. So it was a big deal when he was at the at the end of our driveway with his brothers and sisters waiting on on the bus and um I drove over to the school behind the bus school's not far from my house to walk him into school and he didn't need me he had been in and out enough with his brothers and sisters and he he says I got this you know and um I kind of cried on the way home and I got home and I said, you know, this is really what I had prayed for and hoped for was he for him to to grow up. And this was a joyous day, not a um, depressing day. And I spent it watching TV Mm -hmm. with my feet propped up. um, And I thought, you know, this is good. This is a good life. You know, (laughs) that and and it was also a big deal for him to get married and and have a child. All, you know, every time he made a milestone, that was significant, uh, always. I, I'm looking forward to him to growing up to be an old man. <laughs> <laughs> and my final question, what's your take-home message that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience? Transplant, save lives, and uh, get, give you quality of life. And that was, that was one of the things Dr. Kenner promised me. He said he'll have quality of life. And uh, because Nick had a heart transplant, he has had quality of life. I took a picture two weeks after Nick was transplanted. He's playing in the dirt and has mud, I mean, from head to toe, which I'm sure in the medical community was not the right thing, but he was having a good time. And I sent that picture to Dr. Cantor and I said, you promised me quality of life. And for a two-year-old, a mud puddle is it. So um, I'm gra- I'm grateful for the donors and I'm really grateful for the medical care that Nick has had. Susan, thank you so much for sharing your story and insight. And thanks again for being on the show. 
Thank you. I appreciate it.